Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to the September edition of our roundtable. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by Better Investing and Manifest Investing, and we just uh, thoroughly enjoy working with the uh, Investment Club Nation and the individual investors who follow the the principles and methods of the modern investment club movement. My name is Mark Robertson, and I'm joined here tonight by uh, four very dedicated people who really just want to share what they've learned over the years of, with investing. Kim Butcher from Evansville, Indiana. Ken Kavula from, oh, he's from everywhere. He's in 19 investment clubs, and he's all about Michigan. Herb, <laughs> Herb Lemkul from Traverse City, Michigan, also known as God's Country. And Hugh McManus, well, he doesn't have a permanent address seemingly anymore because he's in Indiana tonight, but sometimes he lands in Pasadena. So we just want to all reach out and, and welcome you, especially if you're new to the program. Big hug to you guys and big hug to anybody who might be returning. We're going to spend some time talking tonight about information, DNA, meat, cell phones. And the, the little caption there, the, the insert image is because today is National Coffee Day. So I thought you might enjoy our little uh, moment with the, that's actually a picture I took in my uh, optometrist's office. It was hanging on the wall in the, the waiting area. Ah. So let's go ahead and get the official stuff out of the way. No investment recommendation is ever intended at any one of these sessions, be it Manifest Investing or the National Association of Investors, Better Investing. Everything we do here is for illustration it's to demonstrate a method. We keep track of the stuff that we do. We are serious about trying to come with some decent ideas to share with you and to demonstrate some of the techniques that we've learned in the world of investing. But again, illustration and demonstration only, no recommendation. If you'd like to be added to a, a reminder, Natalie sends out, Natalie Kabula sends out a couple times a month uh, reminders about the sessions. You can write to her at nkabula1 at comcast.net, and you're also welcome to write me if you have a question or want to do some follow-up at markr at manifestinvesting.com. Well, here's our standing agenda. We're just going to go through some uh, a little bit of history, a little bit of results, a little reminder as to what we're trying to do here. Kim is going to present McGraw-Hill Financial. Uh, Herb's going to bring Tyson Foods, which is timely considering the Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Uh, Ken Kavula. We'll do a Lumina, ticker symbol ILMN. He was on the road, so he hasn't had time to to, to pull off and actually generate a, a stock study, but he has joined us from Indianapolis tonight, and he, he'll be here if there are any questions or if he has any comments along the way. And then I'm going to come back with a repeat section, a uh, selection of Apple. I um, have a hard time avoiding that company these days. It, it's looking kind of nice considering all that's going on. And then we off, uh, almost always open it up to an audience poll. Just a quick introduction as to what we're doing here. We are all attempting to bring you a, an idea, an idea that's near the top of our shopping lists at the current time. We do want to make selections that outperform the Wilshire 5000 after we pick them. We keep track. We'd like to see the overall results of the complete collective portfolio beat the market by five percentage points. That's consistent with the objective of the modern investment club movement of trying to beat the market by five percentage points. We're going to spend some more time with that in a minute. We'd also like to see three out of every five or maybe even more than that exceed our expectations, either meet or exceed our expectations, and that's what we're after here. That's what we mean by that accuracy component. Here's a look at how we're doing. Again, I, I think that arrow is not a dream. It's, a, it's an objective, and it's certainly in the right direction. Uh, we have had uh, accuracy go up in this falling market. And the other thing that's interesting is we're actually doing better in this declining market than, again, probably the average investor. A lot of stocks are down, but you can see we've actually nudged up here in the last month. We do have a positive relative return. That five percentage point objective is shown by that red dotted line. And again, the definition of relative return is actual return achieved by a portfolio minus the actual return from, say, a benchmark like the Wilshire 5000. So we're basically beating that Wilshire 5000 by about a percentage point right now. And we'd really like to see that approach 5%, if not exceed it over time. Over half of our picks have outperformed the market. Any questions or comments at this point, Ken? 
Uh, no, we're staying really current with everything that's going on. I'm answering a few questions in the background. Uh, if you have questions, folks, don't forget you can type them in the questions box, and I'll try to answer them, or I'll uh, pose them to our panel. And if you'd like to speak out loud, just raise your hand. You have a little button that allows you to do a hand raise, and when it comes to an appropriate moment, I'll unmute you and we'll allow you to make your comment or ask your question. It's really gratifying to see so many of you here this evening. Uh, so, Mark, uh, we're all caught up at the moment. And the other thing, we do try to save time for a Q&A period at the end of the session, and nine times out of ten, we're able to do that. Let's take just a real quick look at the tracking portfolio, that link across the top of your page, whether you're a manifest investing subscriber or not, that's a public link. So you can actually enter that entire link and you'll, you'll be able to see what we call a dashboard it's for tracking portfolios, where what we think are the most important characteristics of any portfolio design are on display. And uh, from top to bottom, you can see the, the companies that are most influential with respect to our results, and the key at the top there, um, Cognizant Technology has been selected 12 times. Every time we pick it at one of these sessions, we invest $1,000 in it. So $12,000 has been invested in Cognizant. And as you can see, it is now up to $18,744. So it's gained a pretty substantial amount. It is the most frequently selected stock during the last five years. Now, by our participants, most of those selections were probably made by, well, I know they were made by Cy Lynch. Um, you can see that Apple has been selected uh, seven times. We'll make it eight tonight, but it's actually been performing pretty well, and so on and so forth down the list. Those are the most influential ones. If you want to see some of the other ones that are just off the list, again, you can go to that link and uh, experience that. Again, any portfolio we'd like to see built and targeted at a return that beats the market by five percentage points. So tonight, the uh, the return from the average stock, the return forecast for the average stock is about 9%. So that number down in the lower right-hand corner, 13, is actually in the neighborhood of 14. We'd like to you know, make our picks that, to keep that number at least there or perhaps boost it higher. We also like to see portfolio quality. That's a number that ranges from 0 to 100 with that anything above 80 being in the top quintile or deemed excellent by us. So the overall average, the weighted average for the portfolio is excellent. And also we like to pick enough small companies, it's one of Ken's favorite playgrounds, so that we keep that growth rate up uh, in the, preferably in the 11 to 12% range. And you can see we're just a little bit short of that at 10. So again, our interest should probably peak in the, the smaller companies. And uh, Ken has done some recent work with the Fortune Fastest Grower list and the Forbes Best Small Company list will be coming out between now and Halloween. It actually came out on October 14th last year. And we'll probably be spending some time with that, along with some leadership mutual funds to identify some small companies of potential interest. Any questions or comments about the portfolio at this point from anybody? Yeah, Mark, I, I think it's interesting for folks to uh, kind of dig down into this particular chart. Uh, if you want a chart of all of the... Uh, uh, holdings in the club, a, a dashboard of all of the holdings, uh, that's also available uh, right online uh, at the Manifest site. Uh, you can go there, it's uh, up there on the top is the URL, but what I like to do is compare the value of a holding against the number of times it's been chosen. Uh, Mesa Labs, for example, I noticed that it's only been chosen three times, its ticker is MLAB, uh, and yet it's worth six thousand plus dollars right now so there's a double your money and since we've even only been going about five years that's the kind of stock uh, that we're you know we've always been talking about uh, in better investing and uh, we seldom really find on a regular basis that's a, a really great stock especially with what's been happening in the market the last uh, six or eight weeks uh, there's a number of those on this short list and as the list gets longer it's very interesting to see what some of the choices that only have been chosen once or twice uh, are doing as far as value is concerned. Uh, we have some really great values in some of our, our seldomly picked stocks uh, that are further down this list that Mark hasn't captured tonight. So if you have some time, go to that complete dashboard and take a real careful look at it. You might uh, be pleasantly surprised at how some of the stocks have performed. 
Absolutely. You know, you're basically looking at the list of stocks that make or break us, but the ones at the bottom can be very influential too and can be some very special ideas and performers, and that's, that's something we'll talk about here in a minute. I, I thought we'd just take a moment, and I just have three slides to dedicate to an educational segment here for a few minutes. Ken and I do quite a few investment club visits, and a couple times in recent uh, in the recent past, as recent as last, what was it, Wednesday, Ken? Um, spend some time with investment clubs that, uh, you know, one of the things we encourage all investment clubs to do, or individuals for that matter also, but particularly investment clubs, is to use their performance benchmark report and their club accounting software to basically look at that relative return thing we were just talking about. And, uh, you know, the club we were with on Wednesday night had, uh, they basically were at the market 7% over, they were at 7% during a period when the market had advanced 7%. If you're not careful when you find that kind of, you know, it's kind of like getting a, a C on your report card. Uh, if you're not careful and keep it in context, um, it, it can actually distort your, your view of the world. And I uh, just thought we'd share a couple slides here. The first being, you know, keep in mind that that elevated performance, especially anything up and towards that 5% uh, line that we were talking about a minute ago, is rare, extremely rare. And as... Um, this guy's actually an academic that has done a number of studies that are part of uh, uh, education um, curriculum for all analysts and that sort of thing. But Mr. Fama points out that not very many actively managed mutual funds beat index funds. And he only he cites only the top 3%. So I, I thought what we do is give that just even a little bit more context. You know, right now there's about 8,400 funds that are classified as U.S. equity on Morningstar. And we find not 3%, but 22% of them have outperformed the Wilshire 5,000 if you're looking back over the last five years. Now, again, he was talking about a longer period of time, but 22%, whether it's 3 or 22, uh, again, keep that in context. It's this What we're attempting to do here is not easy. And in fact, if we want to talk about our five percentage point objective when it comes to the, you know, what are we really targeting and shooting for as most investment clubs, only nine of those actively managed funds have beaten the market with a relative return, again, that red dotted line of 5% or more. That's 0.1%. So, again, you want to keep that in context. What I thought I would do is share, well, who are some of these people? And what you find when you dig in a little bit deeper is that, well, it's not nine, it's really, I don't know, four or five. Because Gilead, that event tied Gilead. Ken, I'm getting a little bit of keystroke noise. You must be answering questions. Um, that event tied Gilead, that shows up, that's just a, a bunch of different classes of virtually the same fund, but um, we are going to be digging into a few of those. We've already been covering T. Rowe Price New Horizons for a source of ideas, but uh, this Smead Value Institutional Fund it's kind of fascinating. It's a fund that operates out of Seattle. It has 26 stocks in it, and it has a turnover rate of about 13%, and they have managed to achieve almost an 18%, well, 17.2% uh, annualized rate of return over the last five years. So whatever they're doing, it's, it's kind of interesting. So again, from top to bottom, this can be an, a, a place where we discover people who seem to know what they're doing. We obviously look at 10-year periods and, and various time frames. But the thing to keep in mind, this list started with 8,400 different funds or, or flavors of funds. And uh, again, the list is relatively short. When you start talking about funds that have actually been able to beat the market by five percentage points, and uh, keep in mind that 20% number as you're uh, looking at whatever results are involved. So again, we're, we're not thrilled to be at 1%, but we're quite satisfied with it and, and hope that it will head north from here. So again, just to reiterate... Go ahead, Ken. Mark, what do we know about the Eventide uh, group of funds? Uh, there are four of them on the list from that one uh, fund manager. Yeah, those are all just different classes of shares. So it's really those four happen to be just one fund, really, or one you know type of portfolio. The answer is not much. Um, I looked at the Smead one for a little, few minutes today just because it was intriguing that they have uh, a relatively low number of of holdings and a very low turnover rate. And just for kicks, let's go ahead and jump out of the presentation. I think we've got enough time that we can play with this tonight. Stop me if I'm if I'm crazy, Ken. Um, 
Excuse me, is that debatable? <laughs> is that debatable? <laughs> debate? Well, I know some people that could really uh, engage in that debate. Let's go ahead and just yeah. take a real quick look at this one because Smead Value, it's an institutional fund. But again, if we're talking about the concept of you know, shopping for a place to find some ideas, again, five-star fund, we like to go into the portfolio. Again, keep in mind, this is a, a fund that has virtually no turnover. And just what in the world are they buying? See the 13%? It has to be the Puget Sound chapter. What's that? It has to be the Puget Sound chapter. You think they're out there moon, moonlighting? <laughs> could be. No one else could be that successful. It, it, it's, oh, it's something we can check into when we're up there with them, you. Yeah. And, uh, and just going down the list, and lo and behold, they've got a bunch of huge banks. They've got Kim's PayPal. They've got my Cabela's. That's also Herb's Cabela's. Some very interesting names on here, and I think it's going to be interesting to follow and model this fund. Look at Aflac, Berkshire. And I've never heard of this company. Anybody familiar with Tegna? Anyhow, the point is, I mean. No, but I certainly want to dig into that one. It's, yeah, it's we're really just, interesting. Yeah, we're going to want to take a look at uh, any company that's not on here. Now, nothing here is a new holding. That would actually capture Ooh. our attention even more. Uh, let's just take a quick look at the other guys that uh, the one that Ken was mentioning, and then we'll get we'll move on. This is that uh, Eventide Gilead fund. It'd be kind of interesting just to look into what might be. This one might be right up your alley, Hugh. Yeah, it looks like they've got some. Uh, a little more frisky stuff in this fund, but it could be some fun. And for instance, down here, they do have a new holding in CyberArk software. I have no familiarity with that company. But again, what we're demonstrating here is looking for somebody who's at least been successful. They may have been lucky. You know, We know how that all works. But you start doing it over five years, it starts to become statistically compelling. And uh, again, you can look over their shoulders and see if you can't discover an idea or two. Look what's showing up too beneath CyberArk there, Mark. Oh, I lost it. Where is that? Uh, right, two oh. beneath CyberArk, Synaptics, uh, one of the companies we've featured a number of different times, talked about on at a lot of different venues. Yeah. Sure, and, and Palo Alto Networks is is one that a number of people have mentioned to us several times. Celgene, of course, is already pretty closely followed by us. Sun Edison kept coming up in this week's update. You know, so again, this is just, uh, we're just showing if we don't cover these companies, you can expect to see them show up in Manifest Investing. We're going to do the same thing with some of the small company funds that have had success. But again, mm -hmm. coming back to the point, the whole point really is this, this matter of context and, uh, you know, shooting for beating the market by five percentage points is an ambitious goal. In fact, Nicholson in the later stages of his lifetime admitted that it was really a stretch goal. I, mean, I think he used uh, much more colorful language than that, but uh, it was just merely to say, get out there, invest, and, and you know, you know, reach for the sky without getting carried away, and interesting things can happen. Mark, we have a really smart audience. Uh, Terry is giving you an answer on Tegna right away. Uh, Tegna is a new company which owns the media holdings that used to belong to Gannett. It was a recent spinoff. Okay. I'll, be, I'll bet you that's somewhere on Kim's radar screen, too. She follows that stuff pretty closely. Good I try. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Um, We'll probably do some educational sessions just demonstrating some of the stuff that we were just going over in the near future. So be watchful for those type of opportunities. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and switch into the next part of the program. Kim Butcher is going to take us on a tour of McGraw-Hill Financial. Yes, I will. Well, everyone uh, probably remembers McGraw-Hill and remembers that name as the educational company with books. Well, about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, they spun off and actually sold their education division, and McGraw-Hill Financial was the spinoff from it. So and in following spinoffs, the stock closed today at 8540. Next slide. 
A lot of you may not be aware, or you may, McGraw-Hill uh, Financial Stock is a service company. And one of the things I can remember reading from the Pat Dorsey book, the little book that builds wealth, is one of the most profitable kind of stock is a service stock. And that is exactly what McGraw-Hill Financial does. They provide the service of ratings for stocks, mutual funds, index funds, ETFs. And it's a real sticky business, so it's got a great moat. They've got nice fat margins, as well as they've got a lot of reoccurring revenue. Those are all like sweet words to me. They even have the uh, things in the Indian, ra uh, Indian uh, rating agency in India. So they're getting very, very global. Next slide. From their 2015 investor fact book, um, this is what their uh, vision is with their mission. They want sustainable growth in the global markets in everything, commodities, corporate markets, and providing that service of intelligence of data for them. And what's really interesting about that is that's the kind of company that is a cash generating, not a cash consuming company because all they have to do is have more analytics and more computers to do it. Next slide. This was last year's performance. They had 7% revenue increase, 20% uh, increase in the adjusted uh, diluted earnings per share. I love this next one of more than uh, $1 billion of free cash flow. You can do a lot of things when you got a lot of free cash. Um, even more importantly, if you're looking for dividends, they increased their dividend by 10%, and they are one of the few that have been paying a dividend consistently since 1937 and been increasing it. Currently, if you're questioning, it's $1.32, which is a little bit less than 2%. Um, they repurchased 4.4 million shares, and they do have an authorization out there right now to purchase back another 42.9 billion shares back, as well as if you look at the overall level on it, they have per repurchased almost 25% of their shares. They sold off their McGraw-Hill construction area, brought some more cash on the balance sheet, and they have been trying to... Uh, get rid of the any of the fluff in the company and they've saved 140 million dollars. Next. You can see how their track record of growth has been over 10 percent, um, but they've given guidance of this year for middle single digit and their margins, as I said, you can't complain about a company who's got margins 29, 31, 33, 35, nice and fat and juicy and that, that, that's what makes us money, and I'm really fond of that. Next. Uh, they've got double-digit earnings growth and 24%. Uh, when you see the uh, 2000 and uh, um, the value line that was in August, uh, currently for 2015, they expect their earnings to be $4.35 to $4.45, as well as going out to, uh, on the value line, it's like $6 was what they expect to be in the next four years. So that's another great trajectory up. Now one of those trends that is going on within the world global market right now is we've got a lot of debt maturities and bank deleveraging. They've got uh, our invest as investors we're wanting our real-time data and analytics and that's what they provide. The capital markets in emerging countries continues to transform, and they're able to give you that. Uh, their assets continue to shift. The index stuff, they've got a lot of index stuff going on, and commodities uh, information that they need. So they're covering all of those bases for great internal growth or organic growth for the company. Next. Uh, you can see that the most of the majority of their revenue is um, reoccurring, which is as they keep reoccurring, that's a moat. We talk about moats and manifest as well as better investing. When you've got a nice moat, it's really hard to get into that area. One of the very few competitors that they have is Moody's. And let me see. I'm trying. Moody's is at 19.54 billion of a market cap, but McGraw-Hill is the 
big elephant in the room there, 23.27 billion. You can see how the uh, reoccurring revenue is by the business unit, so that S&P capital IQ gives 90% of it, and 60% uh, of it is reoccurring revenue, which is always good. Next. Um, in, let's see, let me get the date of that. On July 27th, they announced that they were purchasing SNL Financial, and uh, this is going to be very accretive to them so that they're going to, uh, they closed this as of September the 1st, 2015, and the market is kind of slapping the hand of McGraw-Hill because they think they spent too much money on it. The stock price has dropped from 109 to 85. Um, you can see that their subscription-based is also 96% reoccurring revenue and 94% renewal rates. Uh, same sustained low to mid trains growth revenue was projected. So this is going to be, um, I think personally, very beneficial to McGraw-Hill because some of those analytics that they didn't have an area covered, SNL did, and SNL was not very much global, and McGraw-Hill is, so they'll be able to expand that as well. Uh, in this combination of the business, you can see here that it's going to... Uh, it deepens their expertise in banking and insurance with new platforms in real estate and media, complementary positions in energy and metals and mining, that subscription base again, and that global footprint can accelerate with the international growth. Um, they have some more synergies expected of $70 million by 2019. You can see I like having companies in my portfolio that are global. I'm just not m making everything to be uh, all of my growth in the United States. So 40% of the revenue is generated outside the U.S. 80% is uh, billed in U.S. dollars. You can see how big this company is. Next. And you can see how their balance sheet. Now, one of the big things I think is great about this company is that one slide where it says they generate one billion, repeat, one billion dollars of free cash flow a year. Um, they also got their hand slapped by the SEC because they had uh, a settlement with them of in January. And if you do an SSG on this company, you're going to be a, see a great big downward line on those earnings because they had a fine of $50 million, $58 million that um, they settled with the SEC and two states of New York and Massachusetts settled with $19 million for the 2011 commercial mortgage-backed securities uh, issues that the SEC felt that they had had with them. Um, so in the 2000 uh, the second quarter 2015, that's what impacted their uh, earnings per share so much. So um, they've made those regulatory settlements. And um, because of the SNL acquisition, they issued $70 million of a 10 year debt and $2 billion a debt for three, five, and 10 years um, for the acquisition. Now, you got to remember if they can generate $1 billion of free cash flow or growth a year, they can pay off all of that pretty easily. And obviously interest rates are really low. So this for me is, um, this is a, a great company that's got great capital allocation going on to help the company grow even larger and they've got the cash flow to be able to pay off this debt quickly. Yeah, Kim, I did some quick looking and the interest rate is like 3% on that debt. These guys are really good what they do, and for me, um, I just personally believe that the market's giving us a gift to be able to get this stock. So, um, And as you can see, they've been uh, great capital allocators, and they're shareholder friendly because they return a lot of cash to the shareholder. And uh, it, it may not be much right now with only a dollar thirty-two a year that you're getting in dividends, but uh, since it raised ten percent last year, I'm not 
complaining when I get more. And overall, there you go. They've got a strong balance sheet and cash flow with limited CapEx because they just do a lot of data for you. Um, they still expect the 2015 guidance to be earnings per share of 435 to 445. Uh, I thought, I guess I had ha thought I had it in the slide. Do I have another, any more slides? Is that it? You just have the value. Oh, there there. It is. Yeah. Ken, we're getting some key punch noise again. He's in a frenzy. Um, yes. If the stock reaches 120, this was the value line that was posted as of August the 25th, I believe. Um, if it reaches the price of 120, that's a, a appreciation of 8.9%. Uh, and if it goes 160, that's 17%. Uh, the 52-week high was 100. And, nine dollars and thirteen cents I expect them to keep on increasing their dividend they may uh, put off buying back those sh uh, 42 million shares that they've authorized till they get that debt paid down and just to reach the hundred and twenty dollars which it's already um, it was up to 109 so Take uh, consider this stock for your portfolio and we'll have to see what people think. Oh, yeah. All of this was taken from the McGraw-Hill Investor Factbook from 2014 and their last conference that they had in uh, September 2016th uh, and 17th, 2015. And go back one slide, Mark. As you can see here, you can see how they've been, been buying back shares. It's down. Uh, if you start, if we start actually at the top, look how much that cash flow per share is going forward. Three dollars and ninety-four cents going out. They think it's going to be six dollars and sixty-five cents. They think d dividends were a dollar twelve for McGraw Hill Financial. They believe it's going to go out to two dollars and ten cents. Look at how little, little that capital spendings per share is and even more importantly uh, Mr. Buffett believes if you are growing your company the proper way you should be increasing book value they think book value in 2016 will be three dollars and fifty cents and in 2018 to twenty seven dollars and a quarter so here's a stock for you all to consider thank you Thank you, Kim. Did want to point out that McGraw Hill Investor Factbook. Kim, Kim had sent that over. It's actually voluminous and it is chock full of stuff. I think what we'll do is post it as an uh, attachment to the thread in the in the forum. But you can find it at their uh, if, if you go to the McGraw Hill website. Uh, that happens to be McGraw-Hill.com if you want to take a closer look at that actual uh, specific reference. Good stuff. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. And with that, we'll go to our man and the meat truck. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is a uh, interesting company because uh, uh, it really started out as a as a company that was started in Traverse City, Michigan. My father worked for uh, Chef Pierre, which uh, manufactures pies. Then they were bought out by Sara Lee, and then uh, Sara Lee became a multi generational company. Uh, they owned uh, Hillshire Brands, uh, they owned uh, J uh, Jimmy Dean's and a lot of other companies. And I've always looked at this company, and this is one of those things where you look at a report and you go, there's no growth, it doesn't seem to work, and all that kind of stuff, so you just don't pull the trigger to be able to do something. Well, all of a sudden, Tyson Foods comes along and purchases uh, Jimmy Dean after they, and that was been just about a year ago. Uh, just to give you an idea, Chef Pierre produces 56 million pies a year, and you can almost smell them baking. Uh, this is the time of the year where pumpkin pies are coming on strong, and they've already started to make those pies to be able to be shipped out all over the country. So it's really a good, good, solid co uh, company uh, that uh, has really blossomed into Tyson Foods. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide? This is, a, as you can see, uh, Tyson, Jimmy Deems, Ballpark Franks, Wright, Hillshire Farms, Adele's. All these are companies that are really strong, strong companies. 
And of course, the other thing that's rather interesting to me is when I start looking at uh, Jimmy Dean's, it's a one of the largest food companies in the world. Uh, they have multi-protein, multi-channel, all-day parts meal occasions, and they're one and two brands of 13 core categories. Number two in frozen food or products growing categories, strong cash flow. The uh, the annual synergy expectations is 300 million in 15, 400 million in 16, 600 million in 17. They they've already sa uh, achieved 224 million just through 2015. So this is a great company. You want to go to the next slide, please? As you can see, the uh, the sales are continually going. And then the profitability and their earnings are just dramatically going up. Uh, this is a company that, because of the uh, uh, Jimmy Dean's uh, franchise or Jimmy Dean's uh, product, which is a Wisconsin-based product, uh, I have a friend of mine who uh, worked for uh, Sarah, Lee, Sarah Lee for a number of years. They also owned uh, Electrolux and uh, 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 Consolidated Foods. So they were a major player in all that. They sent him over to. Uh, to, to look at Hillshire Brands and uh, to be able to look at maybe closing it down and he came back and reported don't ever touch this company it's your number one brand and they all of a sudden Sara Lee became Hillshire Brands and then Hillshire Brands was purchased by Tyson Foods and as you can see Tyson Foods is really going strong the other thing that I think is rather interesting is that um, when I look at um, all the, I, let me see, I got my other report here. Uh, sorry about that. Um, that they, they're, they're really strong in what they're, you know, what they're having. Hillshire Brands is a very strong company. Uh, uh, Little Smoky Links, our number one link in America. Bisco products, uh, sticks, will express experience temperature ranging to minus 25 to over 500 degrees in the journey to our plate. Jimmy Breen, Deans has been lighting up the TV screen with a sun for almost 10 years and counting. Sara Lee offers delicious cakes and cheesecakes and food service. That's more of a institutional product that they're sending out. 90% uh, 90, 90 of all pepperoni, pepperoni you eat on frozen pizzas is sold by Tyson Foods. Many leading delivery chains use toppings and crusts from Tyson's. Tyson's makes soups and dips for many fast, ca fast casual restaurants. We make over 5 billion pounds of box beef and 3 billion pounds of pork product every year. So it's really an interesting product and an interesting company when you start looking at that. Uh, they've received many, many awards. Uh, they are uh, number one in uh, per the chickens. So they, uh, and it's amazing how much chickens they use. Uh, it, it, to be able to, and they're also now starting to get into the uh, fresh chicken. So it's going to be a, a great thing. Uh, when you start looking at, um, it produces one out of every five pounds of chicken, beef, and pork in the United States. Uh, so that's a, that's a huge uh, piece that really comes on strong. You want to go to the next slide, please. So as you can see that, uh, you know, the pre-tax profit on, on Tyson Foods is uh, three and a half to three, three, four, three and a half percent, so it's even. Uh, earned on equity, you know, as you can see, they're continually in an upward trend. Uh, the present price of $43 is close to its high. Next food, next uh, slide, please. So, the, so as you can see, uh, when you start looking at this price, uh, that it is currently in the buy range. Uh, so, you know, and it's also one of those companies that may or may not give you the par that you're looking at, but I think the potential increase is far greater than what some of the uh, value line or mortgage star gives you a, 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 an idea for. It is a three to one upside down downside ratio. Uh, as you can see, it's a strong buy by S&P Capital. So that's uh, another ad, added comp uh, in, in interest on that. One of the things I thought was rather interesting on this is the purpose of Tyson is making great food and making a difference. Their vision is being a global leader in food ex uh, exports. Their strategic intent is to sell more branded protein-centric foods, profitability to, uh, uh, than any other company in the world. 97% of the products 
are in the frozen and refrigerated section. And that is the section that is getting more positive growth in any grocery store. Most of them are looking at a 1 to 1.2 percent. The frozen food section is about 3 percent increase in growth. So this is a solid, solid company. Next slide. So remember, this is a eat <laughs> eat ham month. Uh, no, this is a this is a chicken month. Chicken and, month. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> the turkeys want you to eat more ham and more chicken, <laughs> but uh, you know this is a very strong company, uh, and I would uh, look at it not so much as a uh, one of those high growth companies, but as one of those core program uh, companies that you might hold in your portfolio for the long term because it's going to continue to offer dividends. It's also uh, repurchasing shares and they have a strong cash flow to be able to do that. So this is uh, my discussion is on Tyson Foods. Thank you. Well, thanks, Herb. You're really making me regret skipping dinner tonight. <laughs> Herb, well, you know, yeah, go ahead. Herb, we have a question from Pat. Pat, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Go ahead, Pat. Okay, uh, must be a hand must be a hand in air. So I'm going to mute Pat back up. And thank you, Herb. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here with you. You're most welcome. Thanks, Herb. And with that, we'll go into uh, into the lab a little bit with Ken. And once again, he's bringing out uh, a company that might be a little bit lesser known to some of us. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, I like to look at companies that, that maybe have the chance to really change things five or ten years down the road. Uh, I've been very successful at, at identifying some of those companies early and getting into them and then holding on to them as we move forward. Uh, and Illumina might fit the bill. Uh, Illumina uh, takes advantage of the biotech industry, but technically it's not actually a biotech company itself. It's a it's a device in the healthcare uh, sector, and it's it makes uh, medical measuring uh, tools, diagnostic tools. So let's take a real little uh, in-depth look at what the company does to start with. Uh, slide, please. Uh, their mission is to prove human health, uh, to improve human health by unlocking the power of the genome. Uh, if you don't know what the genome is, uh, within our lifetime, in the last 15 years, scientists have been able to do a complete sequencing of the genes uh, for a human being. Uh, we find out how close we are to some of our animal cousins uh, by looking at the genomes of the different uh, animals. Uh, I've read studies that show that the genome between a human and a chimpanzee, for example, is 97% similar to each other. So the genome is going to be unlocking all kinds of things, and uh, I'm looking for a time in the next 20 to 30 years when medicines are going to be tailored to the particular genetic sequencing that a human being happens to have been born with, uh, where we're going to have boutique medicines rather than a one-size-fits-all kind of uh, prescription to solve a problem. Slide mark. Here's what Illumina does. It makes kits and machines to help sequence the genomes. It makes very small, relatively cheap kits, and it makes huge sequencers that are extremely expensive. Another slide, Mark? Uh, this was the slide that convinced me I wanted to learn more about the company. Uh, back in 2002, it was estimated that the cost to sequence a, a genetic code for a human individual was somewhere around $100 million for an individual. Uh, today, the Illumina equipment, and there's not a whole lot of competition uh, for this type of equipment. Illumina is the, is the company that makes most of this equipment. And today, the cost to sequence uh, that same genetic code is down to under a thousand dollars. Uh, those of you in the computer field might be familiar with Moore's law that suggested that every so often uh, the uh, 
capabilities of a computer chip would increase by a factor of 10 and the costs would go down by a factor of 10. Well, uh, you can see that the speed at which the cost uh, in sequencing the genome is falling is greatly surpassing even what would be predicted by Moore's law. Uh, I think that we're looking uh, within the next couple years of prices that are going to move under $100 and this indeed uh, are goals that the company has set for itself. Slide Mark. Uh, if you take a look at these circles, you'll notice that the very, very bottom of each one of the circles that represents uh, the amount of dollar business that might occur in these different fields, you'll see a little tiny darker colored portion. That represents the uh, amount of business right now from these fields that are being covered uh, by Illumina. Uh, this is about a $20 billion market, and you can see that Illumina is barely scratching the surface uh, of this business in some very lucrative fields. Oncology, that's cancer research, reproductive and genetic health, another $2 billion uh, market with uh, looks like, you know, less than 10% so far uh, tapped uh, as part of the genetic sequencing. So there's a lot of room for this company to grow. Next slide. Uh, just some examples of some of the high sequencing that's going on right now. Uh, they're sequencing the genomes of 100,000 people in England on a project to get a, uh, a general picture of what a typical Englishman's genome looks like. Uh, the Scottish government is doing the same thing, spending 15 million pounds uh, on the project, and that's somewhere around 20 plus million dollars and the White House has called for a new era of precision medicine and by that again we're talking about medicine tailored by the genetic code of, of individuals rather than one size fits all. Next slide. You can see that Illumina does a lot of its business in the Americas, more than half, but it is a worldwide player with a quarter of its business coming from Europe and about a fifth of its business coming from the Asia Pacific region. You can also see that the company makes a lot of money on consumables. Uh, they sell large machines for a lot of money, for literally millions of dollars, but their money is made on the consumable portions, the old Gillette razor philosophy where you sell a really nice razor for a, uh, a break-even price and then you make your money on the razor blades. Uh, the same philosophy is guiding the revenue uh, for Illumina. You can also see that Illumina uh, is about evenly split when it comes to research uh, uh, facilities and commercial and nonprofits and hospital uh, facilities as far as who it's doing its work from. Uh, the consumables gives it a very, very strong recurring uh, revenue stream and the service, uh, those are contracts that are very, very sticky because they apply to equipment that people have spent a lot of money on. Uh, another uh, click please, Mark. Here's just some of the fields where Illumina expects that the genome will become a major part of what they're doing. Uh, in their job. We know that cancer research is dependent on the genetic code, but look at some of the other places where you, it can make a difference as well. Uh, forensics, that's a really dramatic place where some of this sequencing can be of great help. Reproductive health, uh, there are a lot of reproductive problems that uh, the genetic sequencing has the potential to solve infectious disease, another major area where if you think about it, we're beginning to have some issues with uh, resistant uh, 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 drug resistance to various uh, types of bacteria and, and viruses and uh, maybe by coding the ge genome of some of these things, we'll be able to deal with those. Another click, please, Mark. 
Uh, the company, the sales line is certainly uh, nice and uh, consistent, especially uh, going right through the recession. I don't see the recession basically on the sales line. Uh, the earnings line is a little bit more choppy. Uh, if you looked into the years 2011, 2013, you'll find that the company took some one-time charges. And if you compared the Morningstar data, which is uh, not normalized to the value line data, which is normalized, you will find some differences in those two years. The most recent quarters have been very dramatic as far as the growth in the company is concerned. Another click mark. Uh, I like to see analyst estimates staying relatively consistent uh, as we go through the time periods. And I look at the current year, uh, a quarter ago, the projections were at 345. Today they're at 346 for earnings. For next year, 411 versus 412. I really like that type of consistency. I love the growth estimates coming from the analyst consensus for the next five years of 20% plus. And when I do what I consider to be a reasonable SSG, uh, I end up with a par value of about 13 and a half, a total return value. That means selling at the high PE of about 22.1. And I like to think of the return being somewhere between those two values. Another click, uh, Mark. Uh, I've massaged the numbers on manifest investing. Uh, I feel a, that taking numbers that are a little bit more conservative than the analysts are coming in at uh, might give me a more realistic picture of, of the worst case scenario. So I've dropped uh, my uh, PE value a little bit. Uh, I've dropped uh, my earnings per share values a little bit. I'm getting a par of 14, which is very close to my traditional SSG. Uh, I'm very pleased with the results. This is kind of a verification or, or that I'm on the right track. Another click mark. Uh, when I go to the equity analysis guide, the Eagle, uh, I note that, that first of all, I captured this with a price of $167. So that price might be a little bit different right now. Uh, Mark used a sales forecast of 22%. That's a little bit more than I used. He used profit margins about in line with what I used. He has an average PE that's lofty. Uh, but companies like this carry extremely high PEs, especially when they're pegged to grow at 25 or 30 percent by the analysts. Uh, Mark's getting a projected uh, annual return of 21 percent, 21.7. That's a little bit higher than mine, but uh, I'm glad to see that I'm at the low side and I'm still in a place where I can make a tidy sum uh, on the company. Uh, at the close of business uh, uh, yesterday, the MIPAR number, the average for a stock in the database was about 9%, which put the sweet spot in the 14 to 19% range. I captured that only to show that the yellow background on the 21.7% is not that much higher than the top of the sweet spot, so that I'm not really bothered by it, especially when I look at that nice straight sales line that gives me some confidence that, that this is a, a, a probably a pretty decent uh, a stab at figuring out return. Uh, these kind of companies, these fast growing smaller companies are notoriously difficult to come up with an accurate par for. So I'm just going to say that I think this company will grow somewhere between 13 and 20 percent uh, in the next uh, three to five years. Very high quality company at a 93 quality rating. Another um, uh, click please Mark. And then this graph seals the deal for me. I love companies where quality ratings over the years, and this graph goes back to 2011, and I'm focusing on the blue line, and I love companies where the quality rating over the time has been steadily on the increase, a little bit of a bump down in 
uh, the end of 2013 there, but for the most part, a nice steady inc incline uh, to a quality rating right now uh, above 90, and it appears to have stayed there now for a year and a half, maybe going on two years. So I, I really like to see that happening. Uh, ticker, again, click. Uh, okay, we're, I'm done with my slides. Okay, mm -hmm. I do want to just uh, outline one more thing that Illumina has been working on. Illumina is not sitting pat on its uh, major business, uh, which is to sequence the, the genome and to make that uh, affordable for lots of researchers throughout the world. Uh, it's also engaged in a huge study uh, with Sloan Kettering Institution, and the study is on something called wet biopsies. And wet biopsies basically means that they're looking for uh, cancer, but they're doing it with a blood sample. And over the next three to five years, they're going to be taking an extra blood draw from hundreds of thousands of Sloan Kettering patients and then comparing what they can find in the blood biopsy to what they find in the physical biopsy. Illumina happens to think that this is a very, uh, um, this is a place that has a lot of potential going forward uh, to make some decent money in the instruments that would be used to do this kind of testing. Uh, imagine if you could have yourself tested for cancer with a simple blood test and if the cancer could be caught in its earliest of stages uh, because of tools that are able to pick up uh, uh, mutations and pick up various chemicals in the blood much more quickly than we can today. Uh, the other point also is that a physical biopsy many times does not take into account all the different types of mutations that might be occurring in a particular cancer, whereas a blood test would pick up all of the different mutations. Now, whether this lives up to the hype that's there right now, whether this wet biopsy will be a major tool uh, in the doctor's portfolio of tools five to ten years from now, I think remains to be seen. But the fact that this huge study is being done uh, with a well-respected uh, institution for oncology uh, indicates that Illumina feels this is an area that has potentially great growth to it and an area where they can increase their business uh, with a lot of uh, different types of testing materials, testing tools. So I'm suggesting we add Illumina to the portfolio uh, for uh, the roundtable. Thanks, Ken. Quite an intriguing company. It's, it certainly is that last paragraph from the value line analyst suggests it's probably a roller coaster ahead, but um, just something to keep in mind with a company like this. But uh, again, as an investor for the long term, those uh, down down swoops in the roller coaster can be accumulation opportunities. You might have some comments uh, in the Q and A on. I think he's still with us on on the company. He's going to actually take a pass this month. He's been traveling quite a bit and he's probably shopping fervently uh, for opportunity with all those companies near their 52-week lows. Yeah, Mark Rich is reminding me that Moore's law used a factor of two. And Rich is absolutely correct. Uh, I think I said factor of 10. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was uh, I, I was just wrong, okay? It's a factor of two. I just completely misspoke on that number. It's okay? a smart audience out there. Yeah. All right, well, we'll come back full circle to me. Um, I'm going to go with Apple this month. It will be the eighth time we have selected Apple. It's certainly no stranger to, to anybody here. Um, I work really hard not to select Apple, but it keeps bubbling to the top of, uh, you know, screening efforts, and and uh, it came down to this or Ben Franklin, and I think uh, Apple might actually experience quite a surge with uh, some of the business results that they are achieving as we speak. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But uh, Franklin Resources, the financial company, also came up pretty strong. Ticker symbol B E N, but. I think I have some time on that one, and uh, actually Apple might uh, get a pretty good hop. It's in the current update batch with value line, the current issue 7, so it's being updated at this time. Uh, very nice picture. It's going to be bumpy, 
Um, as they've gotten bigger, the, the law of big numbers is kicking in. They are vulnerable to some competition, but these guys are massive and they are executing. Uh, I mean, the picture itself uh, is pretty up straight and parallel, certainly considering the business that they're in. The growth rate has matured into uh, that new new uh, era of uh, life cycle for the company, somewhere in that 10% range now at the size that they're at. But they are continuing to maintain fairly strong profitability, and their ever-increasing dividends are pretty compelling, too. Um, just to show that uh, th these guys are not uh, giving the store away while they grow, um, their net margin has ramped up. Uh, that period of development and uh, deployment of new product out into the market well, about three to five years ago actually led them to a nice surge in, in net margin for the company. And they do continue to maintain uh, net margins in that 20 to 25 percent range. It's not uh, science fiction to believe that they'll be able to continue to maintain something in that 20 20 percent neighborhood going forward um same thing is true with pe the company has matured they've gone through that explosive growth period they have lost a absolutely fantastic leader but uh the the legacy that's been left behind is pretty solid you know when i look at the pe ratio for the company over time it's obviously matured uh, again big numbers kicking in here and I, I literally close one eye and look and see uh, a number is anywhere in the mid, uh, in the 15, 15 uh, PE, average PE, give or take, makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I literally use the big charts every once in a while just to get that feel for, you know, 15 makes some sense to me based on what I'm seeing here. 10 to 15 for sure. Here's an interesting picture. I had featured it on one of our pages at Manifest Investing in the forum. Can you guess what these people are shopping for? And by the way, I think it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, wherever this picture was taken. And uh, they're literally waiting, waiting for the latest iPhone. I don't even know what number it is, 6 or 6S or whatever. That is a crowd waiting to buy an iPhone the next day and waiting for the doors to open. I mean, to me, that's just, that's just uh, unimaginable to me that people would do this but there's an intense amount of loyalty and a fervor that goes with this company that I think few really understand but uh, definitely out there shopping it is in this week's update I would encourage you we're gonna post this in the manifest forum uh, you can also grab it if you if you're using either your value line subscription or your library account uh, just just some quick comments about what's been going on there's been concerns about China legitimate concerns but boy, the, the product launch has been going very well. They did include China this time around in the first release, and, uh, and it's actually going quite well. And uh, so, so watch for some interesting bump in the operating result numbers here in the next few months. And uh, the stock price has been hammered down to that $100 range and could, uh, could offer uh, the possibility of recovery. Like Ken, I also like to, to go shopping for companies that have excellent quality. You can see uh, Apple's basically been flatlining at excellent quality, very close to 100 for as long as we can look back. Um, the stock price has ramped up and, uh, and, and, and swooned a little bit here lately, driving that return forecast up into the mid-teens, which again is an area that has not been seen in a couple of years. And again, the, the buying opportunities were fairly strong back here in the 2012-2013 timeframe. And we're, we're getting kind of a nudge of a buying opportunity as that price has continued to, to fall a little bit here in recent months. But again, I look at a very, fairly strong story, excellent quality, and uh, what I consider to now be a, a reasonable return forecast, e even though some of the fundamental um, forecast behind the company. Some of the, the growth rate expectations and profitability have been reduced in the analyst consensus. It's, it's still pretty strong. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and make Apple an eighth time selection and add it to the portfolio. Marcus, Herb? Mm -hmm, go ahead, Herb. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to that picture and the average age of the people that are in that picture. <laughs> I don't see you and I there. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's actually a little bit more gray hair than I would have expected in that picture, and, and that, that is Brian Lewis on the lower right. So, um, yeah. looks so, like him anyhow. 
Yeah, well, but it's just one of those things that that you know the younger generation really migrates toward technology, and uh, that's what's really driving a lot of these sales. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, and, and then we come after the lines die down. Yeah. Mark, I'm going to launch. I'm going to launch our poll, Mark, and ask our audience to participate this evening. Uh, once the poll gets launched, folks, uh, pick one of the four stocks that you think should go into the portfolio, or tell us that you would have picked none of the above. And let's see where we go with tonight's polls. Uh, I've launched it, and we'll keep it open now for a little bit of time. And for what it's worth, I really think all four companies have a, a very interesting outlook. Uh, we're up to 75% voting, so if you haven't voted, just take your mouse and, uh, or your if you have a touchpad and just go to one of the circles and fill it in. I know that if you're on a tablet or on a phone, if you're viewing us on a tablet or a phone, that the polls are not uh, functional, and we're apologizing for that, even though it's not our fault, it's Citrix. Uh, we're up to 88% voting. I'm going to count down from 10 in my mind here. Uh, we'll take any last votes that are coming in. It's a lot of precincts reporting. <laughs> and I'm going to close the poll, and I'm going to share the results. Did I get shot out again? Yeah, well, I got uh, blown out of the water here, so. <laughs> <laughs> people de people uh, definitely had dinner other than me. Yeah. yeah well, we, we really like, the audience really likes Illumina and McGraw-Hill. Uh, Apple uh, down at 18% of the office, Tyson Food 5%, and we have 1% of our audience that doesn't like any of those four stocks. So uh, let's add a double dose of Illumina to the portfolio, Mark, and I'm going to hide this. Well, I'm very and comfortable with that. As you know, we added uh, Illumina to the roundtable portfolio, model portfolio, no, roundtable, 10 cup. 10 cup tracking portfolio at Manifest Investing last month. Okay, I'm looking at our questions right now to see if we've uh, dealt with most of the questions. Butch wants to know uh, if I have any comments uh, about OPK versus Illumina. And Butch, I, I haven't uh, yet got to the place where I'm doing an industry study on this stock. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I do own some shares of Illumina. I felt that uh, when I first looked at this, that this was a stock I really wanted to own, and I did not even submit it to an industry study. I should slap my own hand for not doing that, uh, but I did add it to my family uh, club's portfolio, and I've been adding it uh, in small doses ever since it took the fall. Uh, I started buying it up at about 120, and I'm still buying buying it down where it is now. Around, uh, I think it's around 80 some odd dollars right now. So uh, I I think it's the kind of stock that I I want to own. And uh, no, I haven't taken a look at its competitors. Uh, I don't know whether it has any true competitors. Although I know OPK does do some of the same uh, business. You could probably even make a case for companies like Mesa Labs being somewhat uh, related. Okay. It might be interesting. Go ahead, Ken. Well, we also have a comment from Bruce. Bruce wants to know, is Illumina associated with the National Geographic or Ancestry.com genetic programs? They're not medical, but rather ancestral, and uh, they try to, to sequence your genetic uh uh, heritage and then decide where in the world your ancestors came from. Bruce, remember that Illumina is making a tool and so I would imagine that Illumina tools are used to do some of this genetic sequencing, but the sequencing itself is done by other organizations and other companies that buy the tools that Illumina provides. So I don't think Illumina is directly associated, but I'm sure some of its tools are being used uh, to come up with these uh, answers for these various uh, uh, corporations that, that will, will give you a genetic sequence for a couple hundred dollars or something like that. Yeah, Yahoo is showing Affymetrix and Luminix as possible competitors. And I, I know that, uh, that Illumina is going to stack up pretty well in a stock study versus those two. Okay. 
Uh, I'm looking for hands in the air, and I don't see any hands in the air. Uh, I'm looking for other questions, and we're uh, we're looks like our question box is is uh, fairly quiet right now. I'm going to do something that I don't do very often. Uh, I have a uh, a person here from Canada. Uh, who wrote to me privately. I sent him an invitation and he did come to the roundtable tonight. Uh, he is from Canada and he's looking for a Canadian club to join. If we have any other Canadians in the audience, and I know we do attract some Canadians to mm -hmm. our, our programs, if we have any other Canadians in the audience that belong to a club, and if you're looking for a member, uh, I can at least put you in uh, correspondence with each other and see if anything would work. Uh, I'm afraid uh, that uh, trying to mix a Canadian into an American club would cause some issues with our tax filings that most clubs would not want to have to deal with. So uh, if, if you have uh, a club in Canada, uh, drop me a private email and I'll put you in contact with our, our person from Canada who's looking for a club. Uh, Mark, I was kind of vamping there to see if there were any more questions or any more hands raised, and nothing happened. So I think that for tonight, we're pretty well done with the roundtable. Now I got to go look up vamping. <laughs> vamping, Mark, is from musical theater. When somebody uh, didn't doesn't come on when a cue is done, uh, the music just keeps playing the same four bars over and over again oh. until the the guy wakes up and and makes his entrance or something, you mm -hmm. know. So that's called vamping. Maybe right? I'll watch the sound of music and get it down now this time. <laughs> yeah, maybe I, you will. <laughs> I think we should issue very special thanks to Kim Butcher and Herb Lemkul for their guest damsel and knight uh, participation tonight. Outstanding job, guys. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Kim, as always, and Herb. Uh, thanks as always. Your your efforts are always appreciated, Kim. You do a lot for the organization and. And you need to hear from uh, as many people as possible how much you're appreciated as well. Thank you all. Mark, Q, thanks for coming this evening. And we'll see you at the next roundtable. And for those of you keeping a calendar, that will occur on Monday, October 26th. And we'll start at 8.30 Eastern Time. And if you're on our reminder list, you'll get a reminder a week or so beforehand. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to close down the webinar. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Everyone. Night.